Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good afternoon. We're live at the Toby Family Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm joining you from our main stage, and our panelists are joining us from across the state and even across the country. And you, our audience, are joining us from your homes or offices. We hope you are staying safe and are well wherever you are, and we look forward to welcoming you back here to our waterfront home. When it is safe to do so, we are already planning our first reopening programs, and we hope you'll keep an eye out for them and join us as soon as you can. Until that happens, this is just the latest in more than 500 online programs we have done since the pandemic started. You can find all of our past programs as well as lists of our upcoming events at commonwealthclub.org. Welcome to Week to Week, the political roundtable of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, your host for the program and the club's vice president of media and editorial. On today's program, we're going to give a review of Joe Biden's first five months in the White House. We'll talk about Liz Cheney and the Republican Party the effort to recall Governor Gavin Newsom, and more. So let's get started by meeting our panelists. First, we have Dr. Larry Gersten. He's the political analyst for NBC Bay Area, and he's a professor emeritus of political science at San Jose State University. You can follow him on Twitter at L. Gersten. Good to see you again, Larry. Same here, John. Thank you. Next is Deborah J. Saunders, who is returning to our panel after a four-year sojourn in the White House as a, as a White House correspondent. She's now a fellow at the Discovery Institute and a weekly columnist distributed by the Creator Syndicate. She's on Twitter at Deborah J. Saunders. So good to see you again, Deborah. My pleasure, John. And Dan Schnur is a professor at USC's Annenberg School of Communications and at UC Berkeley's Institute of Government Studies. He's also the host of the weekly Politics in the Time of Coronavirus, the webinar, and he's on Twitter at Dan Schnur. Dan, you're going to have to rename your, your podcast, your, your webinar? <laughs> Politics after the time of coronavirus, but let's not jinx it quite yet. Thanks <laughs> so much work. for having me, John. Well, good to have you all here. And let's dive right into it. We're now in the fifth month of the Biden-Harris administration, and uh, let's start by evaluating the beginning of this presidency. And Dan, I'm going to give you a big fluffy question to begin with, and that is, what have we learned about Joe Biden and his leadership style from what we've seen in the first five months? Well, I, I think, John, we've we, we've learned a, a number of things about Joe Biden, some of which are a little bit surprising. You know, Biden ran for president as a very traditional, very establishment Democrat. If you remember back in the primaries a year or so ago, he was the safe, more centrist choice running against uh, more aggressively left-leaning candidates like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And it appears that somewhere in between the election and inauguration day, Joe Biden discovered his inner Franklin Delano Roosevelt or Lyndon Baines Johnson. And what we may be seeing now, it's obviously too early to tell, but it's entirely possible that what Biden has identified as a hinge point in American political history, if not in American history. And much like Franklin Roosevelt taking office in 1932 or Ronald Reagan taking office in 19, uh, being elected in 1980, I think Biden and those around him seem to believe that this is a seminal moment in the American political consciousness. And that after more than 40 years of a small government ethos driving the conversation in Washington, they believe that this might be a shift back to what we saw when Roosevelt took office at the height of the Great Depression. So Biden is many things, and I know we'll talk about several of them today, but no question, he is a emergent uh, progressive populist with ambitions along the lines of FDR and LBJ. The question will be whether he can achieve them or not. Deborah, your thoughts on the initial five months. Were you surprised by anything? I think that we've seen a lot of discipline from Joe Biden. I think that he wants to make sure that he's the exact opposite of Donald Trump. So people talk about it being a boring presidency, but really what it is is the drama that we just live through. So 
frequently when Donald Trump was president, it's it's missing. And what they're showing is a deliberate president. Uh, we're not seeing the moderate that we were told we'd get. We, he talked about being able to work across the aisle and work with Republicans. Sure, I'll have him into the Oval Office, but it seems as though everything that they're getting through is done with Democratic votes only. So, so that's an issue. I think Dan's completely right about how he's pushing for big government. I think Trump made that easier for Biden because Trump also talked, he was increased spending a great deal before coronavirus, COVID hit, and, and Trump also was for more spending. And so it sort of opened a door for Joe Biden to go in and, and to continue and, make, and do better. So now we're talking about you know, potentially an extra $6 trillion in spending scares some of us. But there are a lot of Republicans who didn't speak up when when Donald Trump did the same thing. So it, I think it, it mutes their criticism right now. Interesting. Larry, your thoughts? First of all, I agree with uh, both uh, Deborah and Dan in that uh, the, the Joe Biden many people voted for is not the Joe Biden they got. Uh, and I think that in itself is, is rather interesting as to all, all, how it all happened and I think a lot of that has to do with the people who's, who he surrounded himself with, uh, many of whom are very much more progressive but than he is. And I think he's, he's kind of like been drawn into that, which is an interesting story in itself. But here's where I part. Um, uh, and two good examples that Dan raised, uh, Roosevelt and Johnson. Let's remember, in both cases, they had really solid Democratic majorities. And that enabled them to get a lot of things done. Now we look at Joe Biden. He's barely getting by with, with two or three in the House, nobody in the Senate, unless you count uh, Harris breaking a tie. Uh, he's just not going to be able to get much done uh, unless, of course, uh, they get rid of the filibuster. You can, you can only use reconciliation so many times and, and in a very narrow way. Uh, so, so that's going to really uh, inhibit him. And, and, and as a result, he's counting on public opinion uh, to sort of like press members of Congress. Well, it just doesn't work that way, uh, especially when you look at the House and even to, a, to some degree the Senate, because there's this, this barrier, if you will, between the voters and the people we elect. It may not be right, but there is. And as a result, uh, hoping for public opinion uh, to get him through, I think, is a, is a hope and only that. Well, in Deborah, there's you know pretty widespread uh, expectation, I think, that the Republicans will retake the House in 2022 and possibly the Senate. Um, I mean, is it game over for any Biden agenda at that point? And if they get rid of the filibuster in the Senate now, could that immediately bite them when uh, if the Senate you know flips? If they get rid of the filibuster and Republicans are in control in, in 2022, there's no question they're going to take back all the tax hikes Biden had. They'll get the credit for it from uh, from from businesses that will be rather happy if that happens, assuming. And so I, I think that. Um, I think that he wants to be the and, and the other issue, of course, is corona, is the coronavirus. And while that's the one area that he can do alone, I mean, he's been able to uh, engineer. Uh, he can. He doesn't need Congress to get most of that stuff through. And we're seeing him stumble a little bit on that as well. He's enjoyed the benefits of Operation Warp Speed and the vaccines that went through under, under Trump. And we're seeing a, a wonderful decline in cases. And people are feeling confident about going out in the world. The CDC has said that you don't need to wear masks indoors or outdoors if you've been vaccinated. And people are feeling liberated. The question is, is he going to benefit from that? Um, and certainly he deserves credit for much of the good things that are, are that have happened. Oh, or is he going to seem to be trying to tamp things down too much? A, no, a number of uh, employers are saying that they can't find people who will work for them because of the extra money they get from unemployment insurance. We're looking at a possibility of inflation. So this is a really... Uh, tenuous time for Joe Biden. He's shown himself to be very self-disciplined. He's got a crack team advising him. We'll see what happens next. Okay. Well, we'll get into the economy a bit more a little later. But Dan, uh, could you talk a bit more about if Biden has basically a year and a half or whatever to to do any sort of agenda, working with a very thin majority, you know, uh, does he need to and can he move fast enough now to forestall becoming a lame duck after the uh, midterms? I'm sorry, Dan, you're, you're muted. 
Sorry about that. Um, I think a couple of really important points uh, to your to your question, John. Um, one is Larry correctly pointed out, as he is wont to do, uh, he, Biden, does not enjoy anywhere near the type of commanding majorities that Roosevelt and, and Johnson did, which means his presidency will essentially be as aggressive as Joe Manchin wants it to be. And there are a lot of Americans in the political center, particularly in the Great Lakes states who elected Joe Biden, who think that's just fine. But it also makes for a somewhat restive Democratic party base. As it relates to the filibuster, this is the first of the two points I, I would make. The Supreme Court's decision to accept the Mississippi case on abortion rights on Monday may have a tremendous effect on how the congressional Democratic majority behaves over the next couple of years. In other words, if the court does move, perhaps not to overturn Roe versus Wade, but to severely restrict the uh, access to abortion in roughly half the country, as it would turn out, I can't think of an other issue more likely to convince the Democrats to set the filibuster aside than this one in order to pass pro-choice legislation through Congress. Pelosi would certainly get the bill through the House, but then the question is, can the Senate, uh, with some combination of most, if not all of their uh, narrow majority, as well as a potential support from a Senator Collins or a Senator Murkowski, would, it, would they, in order to preserve Roe v. Wade in this country, set aside the filibuster in a way that they might not for other, uh, for other policy goals? Second thing, real quick, John, as it relates to the midterms, is most of your audience I know knows, because I've had the good fortune of, of being with you a number of times with Commonwealth Club audiences, and I know how closely they follow this stuff is the president's party, as you alluded to, almost always loses seats in that president's first midterm elections. And the key word there is almost. The only time in the last you know, dec in the several decades in which the president's party did not lose seats in those first midterms was the Republican Party under President George W. Bush in 2002. And those were extraordinary circumstances because those elections took place barely a year after the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Rather than I would be much more likely to write off the possibility of Democrats maintaining or increasing their majority, if it, were, if it weren't possible that the midterm elections after COVID might end up being just as extraordinary circumstances as the first midterm elections after 9-11 served to, to boost the Republican majority back in those days. Larry, one other thing that uh, Ronald Reagan had, uh, um, I, I'm not as clear on Lyndon Johnson's control of his party, but FDR, I mean, they controlled the party or their, and, and their, their philosophy enjoyed very strong uh, support. Um, so it wasn't just the numbers, but even Ronald Reagan, who did not control the House, of course, still was able to get his agenda through. Um, does... Joe Biden control the Democratic Party. Are there rival power bases there that are undercutting him? Or does he kind of have it? Can he do? No, I don't mean this as blatantly as can he do whatever he wants. But I mean, does is he pretty much accepted within the party as the one who gets to set the agenda for Democrats for the near future? You know, we I think we often assume these parties are so unified and, you know, just wonderful machines to, to go forward together. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, you know, you've heard the term herding cats. Well, that's how it goes these days, really, with, with both political parties. Um, the, whatever the center is, it floats of either party. It, it floats back and forth, uh, as you see right now with the progressives uh, and the moderates and Democrats and the, let's call them the Trump folks and the conservatives and the Republican Party. So I'm not so sure that anybody controls much of anything. But I, I do want to make a couple of points here uh, on, on where we're going in 2022. And that gets to your question on, on parties, as well as uh, some of the other things have been said. Dan's right. Rarely do you see uh, the party in power actually grow their majority in the off-year elections. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think it's possible this time. If you look at Gallup polls, and Gallup do, uh, does party IDs every two weeks, uh, and look at, at, at the time of the election to uh, the last poll they did, 
a couple of weeks ago, Republicans have lost five points. They've lost five points. They didn't have a lot of points to lose to begin with. They've lost five points. Democrats have gained one, the rest have gone to independence. Uh, that tells me an awful lot. And I think uh, what tells me is that the way that uh, one six has really upset a lot of people. And a lot of them, uh, re Republicans, good, uh, good Republicans, how shall I put this? Conservative Republicans, um, folks who were involved with the Lincoln Project uh, and others uh, have just had enough and they're moving away. And I think there's a really good shot at the Democrats actually gaining, maybe not because the Democrats are so terrific, but because the Republicans are just in such disarray. And I add one point uh, to that, and that's built on what Dan said. The Roe versus Wade decision, it's not Roe versus Wade, of course, it's the Mississippi decision. I could think of nothing that would galvanize Democrats more than to see the Supreme Court come down hard and further erode uh, the guarantees to, to the right to choose. And I think what, where we normally see a, re, a reduced turnout in, two, in, uh, in uh, off-year elections, you put the one-six together with the, with the uh, uh, court decisions uh, that will come out next June on, uh, on the women's right to choose. And I can see Stacey Abrams and the gang moving Democrats in ways that you never expected in an off-year election. Well, I, I want to hop back to Dan because, Dan, I'm not going to ask you to, to recap everything you said in your, your webinar yesterday, but you actually started talking about the numbers on, on, on people's views on abortion, and uh, they actually surprised me because it was not what I'd been kind of hearing, which was that you know, you see, you've seen some polling that makes it look like, you know, the pro-choice side has, has expanded greatly. You had some very, very more nuanced numbers. Can you maybe give us a, 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 a shortened version of that? Because um, that certainly goes to this issue of just how potent this could be uh, post any Supreme Court ruling. Yeah, Gal the Gallup poll, which really is the gold standard of polling um, in the U.S., polls on abortion every year, and they've been doing it for decades. And what I think many people in deep blue California would find very, very surprising is when they simply ask the question, do you consider yourself pro-choice or pro-life? For years, for most of the 21st century, those figures have been almost precisely even. This May, when they polled just a couple of weeks ago, the numbers were 48% pro-choice to 46% pro-life. Two years ago, it was 48 to 48. You have to go back to 2006 to find a 10-point margin in favor of the pro-choice side. Um, and it's been pretty clear over the last 15 years or so that those numbers are almost evenly balanced. Now, real quickly, because I know you don't want to spend the rest of the program just with me reciting poll numbers, <laughs> I think your, your audience understandably and appropriately would point out that the terms are self-directed and therefore might not completely and accurately uh, uh, reflect voter opinion. So I'll offer you just a couple more questions that they ask every single year. One, uh, Gallup asks, do you believe that abortion should be legal under, all under either all or most circumstances or under few or none, no circumstances? So this is a more specific way rather than just labels. This May, a couple weeks ago, the polls show that 43% of Americans believe that abortion should be legal under all or most circumstances. 55% say few or none. That's essentially unchanged over the last several years. And once again, you have to go back to the late 20th century to the 1990s before you, before you find relative balance on that topic. And then finally, when they ask the question yet another way, uh, should there be any restrictions on abortion? Should there be, uh, or should, excuse me, should there be, uh, should, do, you, do you think there should be any restrictions on abortion? Do you think there should be uh, uh, restrictions under certain circumstances or no restrictions? Uh, that middle ground, restrictions under certain circumstances gets roughly half of the vote over the years. But the pro-choice side only uh, achieves a slightly higher margin than pro-life. All of which is to say, this country is much more divided on this issue than many come to believe. And there were many people, toward Larry's last point, who thought when Trump, when President Trump nominated Amy Comey Barrett 
to the court in the middle of last year's election, that that would be a tremendous motivator for the Democratic base. In fact, just the opposite happened. It ended up motivating conservative voters to a much greater degree than those uh, than the, those who believe abortion should still be legal. Deborah, what are your thoughts on on, on abortion as a? Well, I want to go back to your question, which was how Please. much does Joe Biden com- control his party? Yeah, I think that what we're seeing going on with Israel right now is very uh, revealing because I mean, Joe Biden voted for the Iraq War. Right. He's been more of a centrist on foreign policy. He's been very friendly to Israel over the years. And now we have him telling uh, Bibi Netanyahu that he, he's really pushing for a ceasefire fire. And you have uh, Andrea Ocasio-Cortez trying to take away uh, the, the firearms that, that Biden wants to uh, give to Israel. And so these are the kinds of things that show a real shift with him. And, and it doesn't look like he's in charge right now. We'll see how far he moves. Um, as far as Republicans for the next election, um, I think there are basically three kinds of Republicans right now. There are, there's a Trump base. There are self-loathing Republicans. Uh, in the, the Lincoln Project, Larry, you want to call them good Republicans, but they went after Susan Collins, right? So I'm not so sure I'd agree with that. But there are a lot of Republicans who who grit their teeth and they voted for Trump in 2020 because of the judges, because of their views about the coronavirus and what should happen next, other issues like that. And they, I think, have been not happy with the way that the party treated Liz Cheney. And that could have a something to do with the reduction in polls and what we'll see next. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that was our, our next topic. And, you know, there are certain families in American politics that have had multi-generational impact on our uh, political scene, you know, the Bushes, the Adamses, the uh, uh, the Kennedys, and we can add the Cheneys, right? Vice President uh, Dick Cheney's daughter, Liz Cheney, reached the third most powerful position in the House Republican Party leadership. That is, until she was voted out of that position last week after weeks of pressure from fellow Republican office holders to rein in her, her criticism of Donald Trump and uh, the insurrection. Um, so s- staying with you, Deborah, tell us about Liz Cheney. And, and, you know, I think people, again, know the name outside of Wyoming and, and that she's conservative. But how was she seen within her party before, say, January 6th? So, I mean, Liz Cheney supported Donald Trump when he ran for reelection. She was not a never Trumper. She was somebody who worked within the party system. Mm-hmm. She was a valued member. She was somebody from the Washington establishment, a woman. They loved having her as somebody they could trot out. And she was she was pretty powerful. Then, then came January 6th, and a number of Republicans were appalled. Uh, some of them voted uh, to impeach. And Liz Cheney was didn't back off on that. Now, after January 6th, Kevin McCarthy, the GOP House leader, uh, chastised Donald Trump and talked about the responsibility Trump had and what happened in the Capitol. But then over time, he got wobbly and Trump kept pushing on him. And he, you know, how does Trump stay in power? He punishes anybody who crosses him ever and and makes an example of those people and makes any other Republican just fearful to stand up for him. So Liz Cheney had to be the example. And after the impeachment vote, there was a vote to, to oust Liz Cheney, and that failed. It was a uh, it, within the House conference, the Republican conference. And basically, at the time, people were saying, this party is a big tent. We're not going to throw her out for that vote. But after uh, Donald Trump decided he was going to just basically put his heel on her neck, uh, people started to get... Uh, decided that they had to be in line. And the Trump base was really screaming for her head. And all of a sudden, uh, Kevin McCarthy was saying he'd lost confidence uh, with her. It's caught in a hot mic. And and uh, she's out of the leadership now. Has he has he handed Liz Cheney a slingshot? Did, did, uh, did uh, David Trump do that? that uh, we don't know. But now she has absolutely no reason not to fight back. There are Republicans who said that they didn't want to get rid of her. They were happy to keep her after um, her her um, impeachment vote, but because she wasn't being a team player and wasn't helping them sell their message that they had to uh, remove her. But uh, I think basically it was, it was, they were, they were afraid of their base. 
So that's what happened. Yeah, Larry, your thoughts on Liz Cheney and and the current GOP? Is there a rule? Is there a role for her? And is there a future for her in that party? Um, first of all, I think De- Deborah gave a great summary. Um, Liz Cheney, to me, is you know the prototypical conservative Republican we used to all know and appreciate as the other side of the picture. You know, a balanced budget, uh, a close relationship with allies, uh, no tariffs, all these things that were completely inversed, if you will, uh, with the Trump administration. And then they add to that the way he, he preached divisive politics. And uh, and you can see why the Republicans are, are traditional Republicans are, are in such uh, dismay. Um, I think there's not only a role for Liz Cheney, I think Liz Cheney's position will grow over time. Look, um, Donald Trump is a phenomenon. Uh, There'll be books written forever about what happened during the years leading up to his presidency and during his presidency. No phenomenon lasts forever. And and I believe it's peaked. He's peaked. Uh, He's he's lost his his megaphones, if you will, at least for now. Um, And there are a lot of people who look back and decide, you know what? It wasn't all I thought it would be. Uh, I, I really think you're going to see a conservative Republicans rally for what they believe in, longstanding principles. Let me tell you something else. That vote today in the House, the vote on what to do about that commission, to me, is going to be very telling. You had 10 Republicans vote to impeach. You're going to see probably 20, 30, maybe as many as 40 Republicans today vote for that. To me, that's telling. That says we're not so afraid of you, Mr. Trump. And and what happens in the Senate remains to be seen, but perhaps that larger Republican vote may get Mitch McConnell thing twice. At some point, people are going to realize they've got to get reelected. And yeah, sure, there are states, you know, where Trump won by 30, 40 points like Arkansas and what have you. But there are a lot of other ones where it's not going to be nearly so simple. Okay, Dan, so are we going to see Liz Cheney unchained now that she's freed from her leadership shackles? Um, I, I suspect we will. And to, to go back to the way you, you framed the question a moment ago, John, you asked, I think, a, a really smart question, which is, does Liz Cheney have a future in the Republican Party? And the answer is, yes, she has a future in the Republican Party. She just doesn't have a present in the Republican Party. There are two Republican parties at this point. There is a pro-Trump party that the former president assembled himself a group of voters who are extremely overwhelmingly loyal to him. But along with the pro-Trump party, there is the pre-Trump party. And these pro-Trumpers and pre-Trumpers have entirely different visions of what conservatism ought to be. Uh, That fight's not gonna be settled this afternoon. It's not gonna be settled in the midterm elections. If Republicans of any ilk are lucky, it will be settled in the primary nomination during the 2024 presidential campaign, but not before. Right now, the pro-Trump party is ascendant. That's why Liz Cheney doesn't have a present in that party. But what she believes and Mitch McConnell believes and a lot of other smart pre-Trump conservatives believe is that those numbers will not sustain. And that as time passes, there will be an opportunity for a more traditional brand of conservatism to, to reassert itself. Now, I will say this, as someone who switched his registration from Republican to no party preference over a decade ago, my hope would be that in addition to the pro-Trump party and the pre-Trump party, there might be a post-Trump party that maintains conservative principles on some issues, but recognizing the changing reality that America has become since Ronald Reagan was elected over 40 years ago. But for for the time being, Uh, The Trump wing of the party has very firm control. The question is not whether that control, uh, whether that level of support will ebb for Donald Trump, but at what speed? And will that happen by spring of 2024 or not? And that more than anything will define the Republican Party going forward for decades to come. And and just uh, along with Liz Cheney, I don't know if we know the numbers from Wyoming. I, I certainly don't. But, I mean, her next uh, vote that she has to survive is, of course, 2022. Um, state parties are increasingly under, you know, Trumpian control. 
do we have any, I don't know if any of you know, I mean, does she mm -hmm. look like she could have a, a challenger or is she going to sail through re-election? Deborah, please. I, yeah, I don't, I think she's going to be in a lot of trouble. And we, we know that there are people who, 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 she'll be challenged, she could lose. But I think she's going to put, she said she's going to run for re-election. She'll put up a fight. And here's something that's really telling. CPAC had its uh, meeting this year in Florida. And they have a straw poll every meeting where they ask people their preference for who would win the Republican nomination. And Donald Trump got 55% of the CPAC um, straw poll. Now that's, that's a majority, but for Donald Trump with, in a Republican group, a very conservative, very activist group to only get 55%, that showed that his, that there were, smart Republicans who realized uh, that, no, things are going wrong here. He's not going to help us. And I think every month he loses someone. Now, the whole thing, and, and, and by going after Liz Cheney and showing, again, scaring people on the fence about him, the Republicans on the fence, scaring them, he, he might have gained something now, but over time, people are looking at the numbers. They're wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, and, and so... Uh, you, you don't know what's going to happen with Liz Cheney in, in, in Wyoming. It looks like she'll lose but because she was censured by her party. But she might be able to rally and find something deep in people where they're not liking what they're seeing. And also, I don't think this I, I don't think the Republican most Republican voters I know want to see a, a Democrat in the in the Oval after 2024. And John, if I can just add to that very quickly, I mean, Deborah gave a phenomenal overview and I, I, I don't, I agree with every word of it, but just to add to it, uh, smart generals will tell you in warfare that every battle is won before it started, that the pre-planning and the landscape will ultimately determine the outcome more than how the battle itself is actually fought once it's begun. The thing to watch for in Wyoming, to your question, is not whether Lynn Cheney has a primary opponent, because of course she will, but how many? And right now the Trump organization is working frantically to try to convince several different potential opponents to Cheney to consolidate behind one opponent. If they are successful in doing that, then Deborah's right, she's in real trouble. Her best chance of survival at this point is that she falls, faces multiple opponents rather than just one. And Larry, let's talk optics. Uh, this is a party that booted uh, Liz Cheney out of uh, a leadership position, yet has not booted Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene to the curb. Let's turn this, maybe turn the focus of that to Kevin McCarthy's leadership of his caucus. Can you talk about that? I think he's in trouble. Um, uh, you know, he's, he's trying to show uh, that, that he's got control. But the very fact that you're going to see, I'm going back to the point I made the other a few minutes ago, 30, maybe 40 Republicans today voting against uh, uh, McCarthy, asking that, that they get a, a uh, investigation of 1-6 and 1-6 alone, or the, the, event, the events immediately preceding it, to me says there are cracks. There are cracks. And yes, things don't happen all at once. You saw 10 Republicans vote uh, to impeach in the House. Oh my gosh, who would have ever thought that? Now you're going to see a larger number of vote uh, uh, for the investigation. These are the little signs to me that suggest you're going to see some changes. And by the way, if I go back just a, a bit to talking about uh, the off-year election, I think you're going to see a swell in, uh, in uh, Democratic participation because of the Supreme Court case. You say, well, what about uh, Amy, uh, I always forget, Amy Coney Barrett. Barrett. Thank you. Uh, I always get the names out of order. <laughs> Tony Barrett. It's one thing to get excited about somebody coming on. It's another thing to be angry about what he or she does. And the anger always exceeds the excitement. And you're going to see that. I think you're going to, a lot of people are going to be surprised between the, uh, the uh, tremendous uh, angst uh, uh, beginning to appear in the Republican ranks and the anger on the Democratic side, kind of like a reversal of what we've seen in the past. I think you're going to be surprised about what happens. And, but then again, we've been surprised so many times the last five or six years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, speaking of voter anger, let's move to California here, um, at least topic-wise, since everyone is moving out of California, according to the newspapers. Um, 
and talk about the recall attempt against Governor Gavin Newsom. This, of course, is not the first attempt to recall Governor Newsom, but it is the first one that's really caught traction and uh, really fueled by anger over uh, coronavirus, you know, pandemic shutdowns of businesses and religious uh, organiza- uh, religious gatherings. Um, Larry, I'm going to stick with you. The Newsom forces seem increasingly optimistic about surviving this recall. Uh, how optimistic should they be? Well, it's day to day. Uh, if you know, well, that's how we always talk about polls, right? If the election were held today, snapshot, you've heard that. Uh, if the election were held today, a Newsom would prevail. Uh, but uh, he's had an incredible ability to step on himself again and again and again. He got off to the worst start possible in dealing with COVID, making promises about when vaccines would come out, uh, just botching that like crazy, uh, shutting things down, opening them up, shutting things down. Oh, he made a look, a accordion uh, player look uh, like uh, he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, these things, I think, uh, uh, really impacted people, and, they're, and they were angry anyway. You couple that with the schools uh, closing down. And, and try as he may, he couldn't get them reopened. Why? Because teachers were worried, parents were worried. He just wasn't in touch. The good news for Newsom is that COVID is going away. And uh, even though the recall didn't start uh, with that, uh, that's become uh, the basis of it now for so many people. And so the, the better that the state manages it, we now have the lowest positivity rate in the country, uh, the, the more likely uh, that, that he uh, will survive. But I tell you, I think we've learned an awful lot about his leadership uh, during this past uh, year and a half. And uh, I think a lot of people are somewhat surprised by that. I suspect there's a whole other conversation we could get into right on that topic. Um, Deborah, when Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, was, uh, there was a recall attempt that the Democrats ran against him. He not only survived it, he went on to pretty much sail through for then the following re-election. Um, what are the chances that uh, Newsom could, do you think, maybe pull the same thing? I don't know. So I have not lived in California since January of 2017. And it's different when you don't live in a state. Uh, things change. Things change more quickly than you realize. You guys have a secretary of state I've never met. Like that never happened before when I was covering politics for the San Francisco Chronicle. And, um, so things, I'll, I'll admit I don't know things, but I think that Newsom is more vulnerable than most people think. And I, I'll see it to you, but let me give you my theory and I'd love to get your reaction on it. So things are going well with the coronavirus and things are going to open up. California, you all are going to have a mask mandate for a month after the CDC said uh, that if you have been vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask indoors or outdoors. And uh, you still have uh, more than what, half of your public schools doing remote learning. I think that when people start getting out in the world that they're going to find out what they missed what their children missed especially, what happened with the public schools, it's a crime. The CDC was not recommending the closure of public schools last spring. Um, They basically, the the guidance said that if there was an infected person in the school or was a really high area uh, of infection, you clean the schools for two to five days and go through some other measures. This idea of shuttering everything was insane. Uh, The the places in California where people couldn't eat outdoors and what that did to local businesses. uh, I I do wonder if there's going to be a feeling of joy. I talked to friends in California and they're all excited. They went out to eat and that was amazing and they felt good about it. I wonder how people are going to feel over time when they see what their kids have missed from school and not just their kids. You know, most of my friends are middle class or affluent and they they can they can do what they can to make things better but income inequality the inequality of education and what's going to happen to kids who are doing remote learning if 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 they did that uh that's just scary and i think that there's a real possibility that people are going to feel that they were that the that Sacramento let them down and Gavin Newsom let them down. And the French laundry doesn't help because the fact that Gavin Newsom, certainly he felt safe going out 
in a restaurant and having lunch with people without a mask, but then telling all these other people that they couldn't. So I wouldn't be so sure that he doesn't have to worry about anything. There is some immune power that comes from the hair gel. And I think he felt protected by that just in his defense. Um, Dan? Yes, that, uh, that, that tragic day where he fell down and broke his hair. <laughs> Well, Dan, this is this, this is the the second uh, gubernatorial uh, recall that we've seen in recent times in this state. Um, how do you think it is and will be different from uh, Gray Davis's recall election? There's a, there's a couple of important differences. Um, one, the state has gone from being deep blue to indigo over the last eighteen years. And the state is so heavily democratic that the challenge for any Republican candidate is a much greater one than it was in 2003. Second, and I mean no disrespect toward Doug Ozzie or Kevin Faulkner or John Cox. As a former Republican, I've known them all at different points in their careers. None of them are in a position to command the type of public and media attention that, uh, that Schwarzenegger was. So I think those are the, 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 the two biggest the two biggest differences. To the broader uh, question, though, um, I would say that while the recall is still several months off, and there's no way to predict might, what might happen between now and the time we vote in October, November, December, there could be a resurgence of COVID. Uh, we could have a horrific fire season taking place just at the time voters are getting ready to go to the polls. We could see rolling blackouts again, given a particularly hot summer and, and fall period. So Newsom is not safe. But at this point, he's in about as strong a position as an incumbent governor under the threat of recall possibly could be. That doesn't mean that he will survive it. It just means that unless nothing dramatic happens, it's very difficult to see him lose. The one thing I would encourage people to watch particularly if something does emerge to make this a more competitive race than it appears it will be now, is Newsom and his team are taking a tremendous gamble by working as hard as they are to keep any other Democrat from entering the race. In 2003, as most of your audience remembers, Gray Davis and his team did a tremendous job of keeping other Democrats from running for governor. Dianne Feinstein didn't run, Barbara Boxer didn't run. And at the last minute, the then Lieutenant Governor Cruz Bustamante got into the race. Now, Newsom's people think that Cruz Bustamante cost Gray Davis the governorship. I think they're wrong, but it doesn't matter whether they're, whether they're right or wrong. The important thing is they think that having another Democrat in the race would hurt them. And if the campaign were to get tighter for whatever the reason, it really is a huge roll of the dice to say on question, if question one happens to pass and Newsom is removed from office, to leave only Republicans and quasi celebrities as the alternatives for this deep blue state is, a, is what I think is an unnecessary gamble. And I would guess that even if it does look like a safe thing for Newsom come this fall, that there will be increased pressure on him to allow another Democrat to enter the race just to provide a safety valve in case the recall is successful, the reasons that Deborah was talking about a moment ago. Well, and of course, in, in that first, in the Gray Davis recall, there were 135 candidates on the ballot. Um, this year, and who knows what we'll see this time, it only costs either $4,000 to file to get onto the ballot or 7,000 signatures. I had written somewhere else that uh, for $4,000, there are plenty of rich people who will do it as a birthday gift to their spouse to get them on the ballot. You know, it's that or buy them, you know, the International Star Registry thing. Um, Larry, what do you think about the, the challenges we've seen so far? Uh, you know, we've mentioned Falconer Cox, Caitlyn Jenner seemed to uh, seem to have kind of premiered or debuted with the expectation that uh, she'd be getting the celebrity treatment, but that seemed to have hit a, a brick wall pretty quickly. Well, it's early. Uh, we know that. Uh, Faulkner, I think, uh, stands out as probably the most uh, the, the, the best threat uh, because uh, of his moderate policies coming from Southern California, 
Um, uh, he does have some name recognition as a former mayor of San Diego. He's not viewed as a gadfly like Cox is. Um, so at the moment, uh, but but at the end of the day, it, it, it could be even as much as people, not, how much do you not like Newsom? Uh, that becomes critical. And the more people dislike Newsom, then the more attractive the other guys, perhaps Faulkner, may become. Um, Newsom doesn't have any control over whether a Democrat enters. Uh, Diego Rosa has been toying with it forever. Um, and uh, there may be others still. And uh, it doesn't wouldn't surprise me if Newsom looks bad in the polls to see uh, a, a or perhaps a couple of Democrats uh, enter. And remember, once you get to that second question, you don't have to have a majority. You have to have more votes than anybody else. Uh, Schwarzenegger had 48 percent last time. Uh, Cruz Busamante had 31 percent. How many of those votes, back to Dan's point, would have not gone there and stayed with Newsom would be a wonderful crosstab to look at. Uh, but I've never seen the, the results of that. Uh, so you, you, we're, at a, we're at a point right now, and I guess an inflection point, where the, the, the more Newsom can stay out of trouble, absent those kinds of things that would come from afar, like fires and PG&E, uh, the, the, the more likely uh, he can uh, uh, withstand uh, the, uh, uh, the onslaught, if you will. I, I don't know if he can stay out of trouble. Um, you know, uh, Plump Jack getting three three million dollars uh, in PPP money, uh, with the money being spent in, in curious ways, uh, his, his uh, begging people to send their kids back to to public school when his four children are in private school. Uh, this don't do as I I do do as I say thing from the French Laundry. You know, I think we're counting on I should say Newsom's counting on people to forget all this stuff. Uh, with with the economy doing well in California and and a, a, a huge uh, budget surplus that is a one time thing that people may not realize is only one time. A lot to, lot a lot to unpack there. Well, I, I want to Don, uh, I'll, if I, if I can just add one quick sure. thing on the question of another Democrat running. Yesterday afternoon, the Breitbart website posted a poll showing that Tulsi Gabbard, who is now a California resident would handily defeat Gavin Newsom if she were to enter the recall. Otherwise, calm and sane people went absolutely crazy for a couple of hours yesterday afternoon just on the prospect. So I think Newsom's people do have a very tight hold on their party. Uh, but keep an eye in particular, keep an eye on former Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Vitaragosa, who has still not yet forgiven Newsom for the campaign they faced off in 2018. Um, I think that's the... Uh, I think while it's unlikely, there's still a possibility that this race would become more competitive, not from the right, but from the left. And one thing, one thing, I'd love to see the poll. I'd love to see who did the poll and how they did the poll, because quite frankly, I find that really hard to believe. For good reason. Trust me on this one. <laughs> yeah. Cite, cite the source there uh, uh, or note the source of the, the uh, poll. Um, Caitlin, Caitlin Jenner's ad was really interesting. Um, I thought, I mean, I, I wondered if, 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 if Caitlin Jenner can follow the Schwarzenegger model and actually find that people, I think um, her remarks about transgender athletes was something that might be able to appeal to certain people. We know one thing, that Newsom is going to try to beat the recall by, by tying uh, all the Republicans to Trump. We know Californians hate Trump. That's a really smart way to do it. Um, and I, I and it would be interesting to see what would happen if Antonio Villaraigosa got in. Yeah, well, and that, that's what I figure is another uh, weight on Caitlyn Jenner's attempts to, to soar, if you will. And that is she's, you know, getting consulting with, the, with Trump advisors, which is, you know, if there's one state in the country you probably don't want to do that. It's called California. Um, well, could, could we talk briefly? I don't know how closely you're following some incipient recall uh, uh, campaigns here in the great city of San Francisco, um, where we have a very progressive uh, DA, Chesa Bodin, who is uh, facing a recall election, and he's been gearing up his response. And we also have a school board that uh, has gained some national infamy by uh, deciding, among other things, that Diane Feinstein uh, is... Uh, too racist to have a school named after her 
as is Abraham Lincoln and such. There's obviously a lot there, and I'm I'm very briefly saying this, but that uh, if do, maybe Larry, you're geographically the closest. Uh, do you have any thoughts on on uh, have we passed the moment of peak woke, if as I'm calling it, and that that uh, the so-called moderates in San Francisco might reassert themselves here? You know. Recall elections are so strange, uh, especially uh, the ones coming up, uh, especially if they're by themselves. And I, I'm assuming that if these guys qualify, they might be brought in with the November election or whenever it's occurred. Um, and, and so the question is, you know, who comes out to vote? And by the way, that's always the question with something, someone like Newsom. Uh, will his people come out? Will the, will the other side come out in droves? We just never know these things. Even the polls are bad at predicting these things. All we know is the turnout's going to be light. Nobody knows how light and nobody knows from where. And the same, same thing would go for San Francisco with the DA's recall and the school board. Uh, the school board might be particularly intriguing, actually, of all of them, given uh, where they went. And I don't think you have to be a moderate to be upset that they might take away Abraham Lincoln's name. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know how to how to you know, um, gauge the, the, the outcome of that. But it does tell you something about the recall in California and how easy it is. The governor's race, it's the easiest, uh, easiest of all 13 states uh, to, to, uh, to get uh, the recall going. Um, and we've seen it before with others. Um, and it's, it's, I think there's something not right about the recall process and the ease with which people can turn things upside down rather than waiting for an election. Uh, I kind of want to move in more closer into the economic question. And, and Deborah, I have a confession to make. I thought that coming out of this pandemic, that local governments and state governments were going to be basically fiscal basket cases. And as, as uh, Larry mentioned, you know, California is looking at $79 billion in, in uh, uh, even if it's a one-time uh, surplus, that's still a larger amount of money than uh, any, almost any other single uh, state's entire budget, except for a, a few of the larger states. Um, and San Francisco also has a, a bit of a surplus. Um, how do you think that that money sitting there with obviously all of the needs, small businesses needing help, schools, students, uh, the, the, the people who have had to move to other cities and other states because they, they lost their job. Where do you think the political pressure goes to spending that money and or for the political electeds to play Santa Claus? Well, I noticed uh, Gavin Newsom said he wants to spend $14,000 per student and he wants to put some of that money in education. What about summer school, right? <laughs> if my kids hadn't been in school. That's something I'd be pushing for. I think you're going to see, obviously, you've got this, this, uh, th this big boat of money and people are going to look for ways to get their hands on it. But you've got to think about the future for California, as do all these other states. Uh, if there are problems, if there is another COVID eruption, it's going to hurt tourism. And we have a lot of small businesses, restaurants that are where people are struggling. Uh, they, they've, got, they've gone out of business. They're trying really hard to stay in business. They're having trouble attracting people to work for them. It, again, this is a great income inequality thing where you've got these big tech companies making a lot of money. Uh, but that doesn't mean that for a lot of people living in California, they still face their own economic struggles. And California also not a cheap place to live. So I think that you're going to see a certain amount of uh, pressure with people saying we want something now and people who might wonder that there should be reserves because what's going to happen next? Dan mentioned the possibility of fires and, um, um, and blackouts. And so that's just what I'm, what I'm asking yeah. now. Larry, how do you think uh, Governor Newsom and maybe other other governors who maybe have surpluses, albeit smaller ones, how should they uh, handle that? Delicately. Uh, this is a case of where you can very easily overpromise, overperform in the short term, and underperform for years after. 
We know that California is, has a very volatile economy. It's been propped up very nicely this year. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Silicon Valley uh, and, and, and all of the income from there, as well as, as, well as the, the, the federal uh, uh, payments that have come uh, from, for COVID. This is a one-time thing. And um, the, the governor wisely on, on his part is going to re replenish uh, the rainy day fund from which he took about $10 billion uh, to get through the COVID. Remember, uh, he was expecting a $54 billion deficit. Uh, and so uh, he did that. Uh, that was good and, and to pay it back. Uh, but as far as the other things go, uh, if they're, they, better be, they better be described as one-time investments. Because I'm afraid, like, for example, he wants to go to a universal a kid, a, a pre-K, a four-year pre-K. I think that's a great idea. I really do. I'm, as someone who studies education policy, it's fabulous. It's costly. And you can do it this year and maybe next year. But where's the money going to come from after that? And that's why people, I think, are worried about a tax increase downstream. So that's why he said, I, said, uh, I say that he ought to do it delicately, carefully, precisely, and, uh, and bearing in mind that what you see right now is going to be much different from what you see a year from now. Dan? Don, if I, if I can follow up on, uh, on Larry's point and also revisit something that Deborah raised. Um, last year, um, or excuse me, 2019, pre-COVID, when the state was enjoying an, what we then thought was an extraordinary budget surplus, Newsom, to his credit, emphasized the point that Larry just made. He said, let's prioritize one-time expenditures because this money is not going to be here forever. So let's not, you know, let's not uh, obligate ourselves to very costly programs. And he took real heat from the base of his own party on this, um, on health care for undocumented immigrants and on several other issues. But for the most part, he stuck to it. And this year, by contrast, and he's come under severe criticism from the nonpartisan budget analyst in Sacramento. He is, as Larry correctly pointed out, spending immense amount of money on ongoing obligations. And regardless of how laudatory they are, we know from history that there will come a point, given the very progressive tax system that we have here in California, the money won't be there for those programs. What I think makes the most sense, and this goes to uh, uh, the, the, the thoughts that Deborah was sharing a couple of minutes ago, is the single greatest one-time expense, hopefully one-time expense, is the recovery from COVID. And as that relates to education, we've seen a tremendous gap in terms of lost learning from low-income students from low-income families, students from minority communities, students for whom English is a second language, and for foster children. We know for research that the best way to bring a kid back up to speed when they've fallen behind, whether it's a three-month summer swell or what's now six times that, is tutoring. There's been a call out of John Hopkins University for what they are calling a tutoring Marshall Plan to mobilize literally thousands of college students and underemployed college graduates to work with young people in elementary and secondary education who struggled over the last year and a half. And to me, to spend the next two or three years of budget surpluses to making sure that those most disadvantaged kids are getting the chance to catch up is not only a is, is not only the humane thing to do for those children, but it's the fiscally responsible thing to do, given the fact that we know that these surpluses will not continue forever. Uh, uh, Larry, John, could add add something to that real quickly? Um, California schools lost one hundred and sixty five thousand students this year. They disappeared. They disappeared. They left. It's five times the number that the state loses in any one year. No, they didn't all move out of state. Okay. They just dropped out. They're gone. And they were disproportionately minority. And, and they are people who I don't know if we'll ever get back. You couple that with the fact that so many students to this day do not have Wi-Fi. So many students today do not have the equipment that you need. Today, today, today. And uh, we have a lost year. Now, Newsom has, to his credit, asked the school districts to, 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 uh, to uh, have summer school. And he's offered the money for that. Um, but this has been a terrible year. Per Deborah's point, you know, whether the schools, 
it should have been closed this long. We can talk about that, but they were. And, uh, and I think we're going to pay for this for a long time. I think it's a real serious problem, more for this state than any other or than many others, because our education system was not so good to begin with. And Deborah, earlier on this program, you brought up the matter of unemployment, the, uh, the add-on uh, 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 dollars that are, are currently being given out to unemployment, unemployed uh, recipients. Um, talk a bit about that and, and the impact that's having on small businesses. And obviously, that's a, that becomes a political issue. Do you, maybe I should rephrase it this way. Do you think there's any chance that there will be reauthorization of that federal $300 a, a week addition? Or is that going to let run out, do you think? I think that support is softening for it. So we know that there was a, a big uh, prediction for the number of jobs for the last jobs report, and it it was about a quarter of what was expected. And the, the so you have all these all these jobs that are out that are where people are trying employers are trying to get people to take these jobs, and people aren't taking them. So why would that be? Well, one reason would be because your kids are in school and you're making. Uh, and it's hard for you to arrange for daycare. Another reason is that you make more money on unemployment if you're a low wage worker. And and so uh, it's making it hard for small businesses, people who, de- who depend the most on low wage workers to keep their businesses going. What's going to happen to these people? And so there's, you know, obviously th- there's a lot of tension going on here for something that in, I think originally when there was an extra $600, um, that that was sort of considered a way to mitigate the misery of this shocking pandemic. But now that we know that the jobs are coming back, um, th- there's a reason not to, I mean, obviously you want to, you want people to work. And uh, after the, the jobs numbers came out, the Biden administration advised labor to make sure that people are looking for jobs, that you're not allowed to say no to a job. You're supposed to be looking for a job in order to get unemployment benefits. Any thoughts on that, uh, Larry? I, I think it's going to go away. Um, uh, by September, I think, is when this, this, this latest uh, round ends. Um, I think we could expect a lot, uh, assuming there's not a resurgence, which probably wouldn't happen until the winter anyway. Uh, we, can, we can expect the return to normal to be much closer to that by September. Um, and uh, people, I think, are, are, are with, with the kids in school, that takes away, you know, we had 2 million women uh, uh, who l- stopped working to do the job of, of taking care of their kids at home when they weren't in school. And it wasn't only California. It's all across the country, by the way. Uh, and so uh, they'll be back uh, again in the job market. Kids will be back at school. And to that extent, I think uh, not only California, but most states are going to uh, have a, a, a big, deep breath of fresh air. And with that, there's just not going to be the pressure uh, to uh, to continue those those uh, uh, payments, along with other COVID related payments to the states. Okay, Dan, I'll give you the last word. I think I think there are two things to watch for going forward on this on, on this question, John. The first is this month's unemployment figures. Deborah was right that the April uh, job creation numbers were far below what had been expected. What we don't know yet is whether that was an aberration, and for the most part, the economy, economic growth is still on track, or whether it was a warning sign. And we'll have a much better sense over the next couple of weeks when we see the next job numbers. The other thing to watch is there are a dozen states, roughly a quarter of the country, that have on their own decided to end the additional unemployment benefits. Many of those states, not all of them, are offering them instead in what they call employment bonuses, that they'll award to a worker in a lump sum when he or she goes, uh, uh, takes a job. And so having a full one quarter of the country beginning an experiment already with reducing those benefits is going to tell us in pretty short order whether, uh, it, whether it's the right thing to do on a broader scale or not. So two key indicators to keep an eye on that might be able to give us better guidance than we now have on what the best course forward is. Very good. Well, on that note, I want to thank our panel for today, Deborah J. Saunders, Dan Schnur, Dr. Larry Gersten. Thank you for your time and your expertise. And thanks to all of you who are watching and listening online. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you again in person in the not-too-distant future. 
Until then, goodbye.